I'd like to continue the celebration of linear algebra by showing you guys how we can write the split complex numbers, which are numbers of the form a plus bj, where j squared is equal to 1, in matrix form. And this is going to be in preparation for some neat little applications I might have for you with the split complex numbers. I have a video where I go into the split complex numbers in a bit more detail, but let me review the major concepts. So the split complex numbers are numbers of the form a plus bj, just like the complex numbers are numbers of the form a plus bi, a is going to be called the real part, and B is going to be called the imaginary part still. Now, instead of a, an I, I'm going to have this thing called a J, and it's going to have a property that J squared is going to be 1. Now, you should contrast that to the complex numbers where you have an I, and I squared is minus 1. But as we're going to see, this squaring to 1 instead of minus 1 is going to make all the difference in terms of multiplying and what these numbers do when you multiply them. So what I'd like to do is derive for you the multiplication rule that we're going to use for multiplying two split complex numbers. So let me take one split complex number of the form a plus bj, and a second, which I'll call c plus dj. And you're probably sick of seeing me doing this now, but this is it's extremely important and it makes all the difference. So I'm going to multiply the a and the c first. Now I'm going to multiply bj times dj, so I'm going to get bdj squared. And then next I'm going to have a times dj. And finally I have bj times c, which I'll write as bc times j. Now what I do is I use this property that j squared is equal to positive 1 to get the new real part, which is going to be ac plus bd. And I'm going to join these two terms together to form the new imaginary part, which is going to be ad plus bc, all times j. And the complex numbers we had i squared is equal to minus 1. And if you've done this procedure with the complex numbers before, that minus 1 comes into play in this step, because in the complex numbers, the multiplication rule differs from the present one in this sign right here. You would have had AC minus BD, because you would have substituted a minus sign there. So that's really the only difference there is that plus minus sign. And just to mention it, if you have a split complex number, A plus BJ, and you want to add it to C plus DJ, that's just the same thing as the complex numbers. You're going to add the two real parts together to get a plus c, and your new imaginary part is just going to be simply b plus d, so you add component-wise. So there's really nothing new to learn about split complex number addition. Another thing I always like to point out too is that whenever we have numbers like a plus bi or a plus bj, we can always write these as ordered pairs. So instead of a plus bj, I can write ab, and if I wanted to multiply, I have ab times cd, and I just write that new multiplication rule we just derived in ordered pair form. So this is just an, probably something you're, you've already seen in the complex numbers, being used in the split complex numbers. So at this point, we have all the tools that we need to find the matrix representation for the split complex numbers. And to do that, I'm going to look at these two new components that I get out of the multiplication rule. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that first part, the new real part, and write it down here, AC plus BD. But now I'm going to take the, the new imaginary part, and I'm going to write it in such a way as the C's and the d's line up in columns. And this is in preparation for writing it as a matrix vector product. So instead of ad plus bc, I'm going to write it as bc plus ad. And now we notice that this pair of expressions can be written as a matrix times a vector. In this case, the vector is going to be cd, which is that split complex number to the right, and to the left, I write out the coefficient matrix. Now I just read off the coefficients here. So in the upper row, I'm going to have a, b. So I write a, b in the matrix there. And then in the second row, I have b, a. These are, this is just the coefficient matrix of c, d. And that right there, the matrix a, b, b, a, is precisely the matrix representation of the split complex number a, b, or a plus b, j. And now just as a sanity check, let's multiply this matrix times this vector in the usual way that you would do so. So in the first component, I'm going to have A times C plus B, D. So that looks pretty good. That matches what I have up there. And in the second component, I'm going to have B times C plus A times D, which looks good. That's what I have up here. This is what we have at this point. We have three different ways of representing the same mathematical object, the same split complex number. We have the ordered pair form, AB. We also have the A plus BJ form. 
And we have this newly derived form, which is a two by two real valued matrix, A, B, B, A. And again, these all represent the same split complex number. You can do a calculation with any of these representations and you'll always get the same answer. That's the conceptual point that's important, that you can do a calculation, you always get the same answer. It's also important to look at the form of this matrix that we've just derived. We see that the real part, the A, is going on the diagonal, and then the imaginary part, the B, is going on the anti-diagonal. And furthermore, it's the same number on the anti-diagonal. If you recall from the complex numbers, when you go across the diagonal, you have to put a minus sign, so this would be B minus B in, this, in the complex numbers, and in the dual numbers, it was a zero up here. And with the recognition of the form of this matrix, we can start breaking it apart. We can first notice how those A's, like I said, go down the diagonal. So I could yank out an A from this matrix and just write a one where those A's go. And that's just going to be the identity matrix, one, zero, zero, one. And I can yank out the B and just write down a one where those B's go. So what I see is that any matrix of this form can be written by taking A copies of the identity matrix, which I'm going to designate with the stylized one here, and B copies of this matrix, which I'm going to give the name J. What's great about this particular matrix, 0, 1, 1, 0, is that it preserves the key property that we set up earlier, which is that J squared should be equal to one. But in the matrix world, we would predict, or I should say we should hope that J squared is equal to the identity matrix. So let's verify that. Let's take 0, 1, 1, 0, and square it, or multiply by itself. 0, 1, 1, 0. And I'll just do the matrix multiplication. I look at the 0, 1. That means take one copy of the second column. So that's indeed 1, 0. And then this 1, 0 here makes, it means I take one copy of the first column, which means I get 0, 1. And that is indeed the identity matrix, because I have the J here times the J, which is equal to plus 1 or the identity matrix. One thing I always like to point out too when we're talking about matrix representations for say the split complex numbers or the complex numbers is that the matrix representation gets rid of a lot of philosophizing that you may do concerning what the J actually means. Now if you were to go back to this equation, the J squared is equal to one, you might say, okay, well J, if we just interpret J as some sort of real number, J has gotta be plus or minus one because those are the two real numbers that square to one. But such a statement is not true in the matrix world. In the land of matrices, you can have matrices which are not equal to one, that is, they're not equal to the identity matrix, also not equal to the negative identity matrix, which still square to one. And we have one such example here, zero, one, one, zero. That's not the identity matrix, it's not the negative identity matrix, yet it squares to one. Another important concept to examine when we're talking about matrices is the determinant, which is a very special number associated with a matrix. Now, if we check out what the determinant of this matrix is, let me call this matrix Z. Let's calculate the determinant of Z, which I'll write as debt of Z. The determinant of a two by two matrix is calculated by multiplying these two entries on the diagonal, which in this case is A squared, and then subtracting away the product along the anti-diagonal, which in this case is B squared. So what we see is that the determinant of the split complex numbers represented as matrices are going to be of the form a squared minus b squared, which is very interesting because this form, something squared minus something else squared, is an equation for a hyperbola. And again, we would like to contrast with the complex numbers. In the complex numbers, we had this matrix representation, a minus b, b a. If we were to go ahead and take the determinant of this matrix, we would find that to be a squared plus b squared which of course is suggestive of a circle. Now, what this allows us to do is to define the squared length as precisely the, the determinant of that matrix. This quantity in, this, in the complex numbers a squared plus b squared would be the squared length of a complex number. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say the squared length of a split complex number is not a squared plus b squared, but a squared minus b squared. So let me write that down here. If I have some split complex number z, the squared magnitude is going to be a squared minus b squared. So this is a slightly different way of defining length that we're going to use in the split complex numbers. Now you may ask, why did we define the length in that strange way? For this reason, 
that if I have two split complex numbers, let's say Z1 and Z2, and I ask what is the magnitude, actually I'm going to call it the squared magnitude of the product Z1, Z2. And if I define the length in this way, I can say that it's the product of the squared magnitudes of each of those split complex numbers individually. Which I hope you know in the complex numbers, that's exactly the case. That when you multiply two complex numbers together, the complex number that you get out has a magnitude, which is the product of the two magnitudes that went in. So defining the length in this way for split complex numbers allows us to make an analogous statement. One important consequence of thinking of lengths in this way is that instead of a unit circle, which is what we have in the complex numbers, which is the set of all complex numbers that has a length of one, instead what we have in the split complex numbers is the unit hyperbola, which has of course two branches, and these just represent the solutions of the equation a squared minus b squared is equal to one, where of course a is the real part and b is the imaginary part. So what all this means, uh, if you're trying to think of this visually, in the complex numbers, you might take some complex number, let's say z right there, and the length is going to be what circle is this on? Well, that circle is going to have this radius, so you can just imagine it being that circle, which is swept out like that. Now, what you have to do in the hyperbolic sense is think about which hyperbola a split complex number might be on. For example, if I just pick some random point right there, let's say z, what you need to do instead is imagine the hyperbola that's going to pass through that point, which might be that hyperbola there. And then you're going to have to ask, okay, what is a squared minus b squared equal to in that case? What's also pretty cool about these split complex numbers is that there's an analog to Euler's formula, which you'll probably know says that e to the theta times i is equal to cosine theta plus sine theta times i. In these split complex numbers, I can actually make sense of statements like e to the phi times j, where phi is some hyperbolic angle. It's going to be an angle, but in a different sense. So it's going to say that e to the phi times j is equal to cosh of phi. Cosh is the hyperbolic cosine plus sinh of phi. Sinh is the hyperbolic sine times j. And I've actually got a proof for this in the, the more detailed video that I put out before. Uh, the essence of the proof really is if you've seen the power series proof of the Euler's formula here, this power series, when you work with the power series, gets adjusted by the fact that j squared is equal to 1, positive 1, instead of minus 1. So that's what leads to the hyperbolic functions coming in here. But it's wonderful that there's a nice symmetry between these number systems. The formulas by themselves are very nice, but what this allows us to do when we start talking about exponentials of hyperbolic angles times j is that it allows us to extend our concept of rotation. Now in the split complex numbers, if you have some complex number, let's say z1, and I multiply by an exponential, let's say e to the theta times i, the new number that comes out, z2, is a rotated version of z1. And you might ask, by how much? By theta radians. Now, if I do a similar procedure in the split complex numbers, let's say I take e to the phi times j, where phi is some hyperbolic angle, and I multiply that by a split complex number, again, let's say z1, the split complex number that comes out is a rotated version of z1, but rotated in the sense of traveling along a hyperbola instead of along a circle in the complex numbers. And again, I encourage you to go back to my other video for more details on that, and, and it, I think a neat little animation showing how this, or what this looks like in the split complex plane. Now this concept of a hyperbolic rotation isn't just abstract nonsense, it's actually a core feature of special relativity. And I, I point this out in this video because I'm going to do another video on the Lorentz boost, where I show you that such a Lorentz boost can be actually written in this form, where I have some starting pair of coordinates, a split complex number, which gets multiplied by e to the phi j to give you the boosted coordinates. And the last thing I'll do in this video is show you how to write this equation in matrix form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this number phi times j. Now remember j in matrix form is 0, 1, 1, 0. So when I multiply by phi, which is just some scalar, phi times j is going to be 0 phi, phi 0, and this equation is saying that the matrix exponential is equal to the following split complex number. Now to write this one, I just convert it to its matrix form, which is going to be cosh of phi along the diagonal, 
There's a kosher fee there. And along the anti-diagonal, I have cinch a fee. So pretty simple. So that'll do it for this video. I encourage you to stay tuned for that next video on the Lorentz Boost, where we apply some of these concepts. And share your thoughts in the comments section. Subscribe to my channel if you like the content. Blah, blah, blah. And thank you for watching.